Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I am James Barton in Washington. Today is Wednesday, April 19. And here are some of the stories we are covering. It appears the internationally brokered ceasefire in Sudan is not holding as fighting continues late Tuesday. According to some reports, medical reports, two people were killed during that exchange of fire, two in Khartoum and one in the Blue Nile. So the ceasefire seems not to be holding. Doctors Without Borders say the situation in Sudan is critical as many cannot get basic health care. Mozambique asked for additional cholera vaccines after Cyclone Freddy. Tunisian police shut down the Ananda party and arrest its leader. Anyone that imagining a Tunisia without a Nahda, a Tunisia without political Islam, a Tunisia without the left or any of its components would be laying the ground for civil war. And Nigerian experts welcome the approval of our 21 malaria vaccine, but some are skeptical. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. It appears the internationally broker ceasefire in Sudan did not hold as fighting was continuing late Tuesday. Meanwhile, civilians, mainly in the capital Khartoum and other large cities, are caught in the conflict between the Sudanese armed forces led by General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and the Rapid Support Forces Malaysia RSF led by General Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo. Reporter Michael Atit in Khartoum tells me the past three days have been difficult for many people, particularly those in the capital city. The ceasefire was announced by the warring parties last evening in Sudan. It was supposed to be started like 6 p.m. And uh, immediately after half an hour, uh, like 6.30 after the evening prayer, there was a lot of heavy shelling around the Khartoum International Airport as well as the reports of exchange of fire in the eastern bank of the River Nile and as well as in the northern Khartoum as well. According to some reports, medical reports, uh, two people were killed during that exchange of fire, two in Khartoum and one in the Blue Nile. So the ceasefire seems not to be holding. Michael, you are in Khartoum. What has it been like since Saturday? It has been a very difficult and tedious life for many residents of Khartoum. Majority of them have not even experienced this before. Some are traumatized. Some have even fainted because the bottle field is concentrated within the downtown and near the residential area where there are people who are a little bit high class are staying. The bottle field is around Khartoum International Airport and the presidential palace plus the military headquarters. And uh, it is very difficult for them to come out for, you know, grocery, for food. And there is no power in many places. So people are just stranded inside. They are hungry, they want to eat, but then there is no way for them to come out for food. The airport was shut down. Are the airports open? No, that is not possible at the moment. One of the reasons for the ceasefire was humanitarian ground, first of all. For humanitarian means you need to allow the airport to operate. You need to allow humanitarian passage for people who are stranded within the offices and within the shops and markets to come out and join with their families. You need to allow the maybe foreigners who are fed up with this situation, they want to travel to go to their country. So at the moment, as I speak, James, it is not possible because the airport itself is a battlefield for both the military and the rapid support forces. For the purpose of our listeners, those who have not been following, what can you tell us in terms of uh, the real cause of this latest fighting in Sudan? This fighting, James, is rooted politically between the army leader, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, and his deputy, Hamdan Dogo. Hamdan has been leading that group at the insurgency fighting for the government of Sudan of Omar al-Bashir in Darfur, and he has been used for that purpose, and that purpose was done. And now he has been moved to Khartoum and joined together with the military and overthrew Bashir. Hamdan tried to present himself as a messiah, as a champion for the revolution, for the Sudanese revolution, for the young people, for the pro-democracy group. But then Al-Burhan is like telling him, your speed is too high. You know, this is not the way how we do it. One of the main reasons is about the reintegration of the RSF into the Sudan army. 
the army suggested two years, but then the RSS say they need at least 10 years for this process to take place. They have agreed on the two years of the transitional period, but the question comes, how can you go to election after two years with two army? That is not possible. So they could not agree. One of also the contentious issue is like, who is going to command the military during this transitional period? Is it a civilian prime minister, is the current military commander, is it the RSF leader? So these are the division and the misunderstanding. Michael, thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you, James. The conflict in Sudan's capital has provoked global calls for a ceasefire, but questions remain about how other countries can persuade combatants in Khartoum to lay down their arms. U.S. officials in Congress and the White House say they are using Washington's status and limited leverage to try to make peace. VOA's Anita Powell reports. Fighting his rage in Sudan's capital since Saturday, as two of the nation's power players battle for dominance, with civilians caught in the middle. The top U.S. diplomat said he delivered a message to the heads of the Sudanese armed forces and the paramilitary rapid support forces. This morning, um, I made calls to uh, Generals uh, Burhan and Hamedi, urging them to agree to a 24-hour ceasefire, to allow uh, Sudanese to safely reunite with their families, and to obtain desperately needed relief supplies. General Abdel Fattah Burhan joined forces with General Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, better known as Hamedi, to mount a 2021 coup. But they then turned on each other. And earlier this month, protesters took to Khartoum streets after talks on a transition to civilian governance stalled. The White House says it is working hard to bring about peace, but declined to say what the consequences would be if the warring parties didn't listen. We've been very clear uh, uh, about the importance of de-escalating. And uh, you've heard Secretary uh, Blinken speak to this. Uh, You heard my colleague from NSC speak to this as well. Um, And so I'm just not going to go beyond to what they have said. U.S. lawmakers familiar with the continent say the stakes are high. I have not given up hope that there is still a path towards um, an end to the violence, but we need to prepare for the very real possibility that Sudan is about to descend into all-out civil war. My concern is that this may quickly become a proxy war. Analysts say the U.S. has little room to maneuver. Washington's ties with Khartoum have long been strained and the U.S. suspended assistance to Sudan during the 2021 coup. Well, I think the challenge here is that um, the leverage that Washington has left is not leverage that it wants to put on the table, and that's the use of, of punitive measures. I think for the last six months, you've seen Washington, um, and even since the coup, um, using a, an engagement strategy um, and an incentive strategy to try to bring the generals around uh, to, to relinquishing power. Uh, the problem is, is that in Sudan's history, uh, these generals don't have a history of responding to incentives, uh, just like they govern the country through fear, intimidation, and their own punitive measures. That's what they respond to themselves. Kuhn says this needs to be a team effort. We do have some leverage, but there's other players in the region that also have um, a lot at stake and some leverage, and we need to work with them in close coordination. That work has begun with the Arab League, Egypt, and the United Nations all saying they will work towards peace. But how soon can they put out the flames in Khartoum? Anita Powell, VOA News, the White House. The medical aid group Doctors Without Borders tells VOA the situation in Sudan is critical. The fighting that started last weekend between the Sudan Armed Forces and the paramilitary Rapid Support Forces has left many trapped and not able to access basic health care, not just in the capital Khartoum, but other places as well. VOA's Maria Madialo has this story from Nairobi. Doctors Without Borders, also known by its French acronym MSF, said on Tuesday the situation is dire in many parts of Sudan. Abdallah Hussein Abdallah, operations manager for MSF, told VOA about a hospital in El Fasher in the North Darfur region. What was happening in the last days is that the situation was very tense there in the El Fasher. Uh, the population uh, was uh, trapped in, the, in, this, in this violence. Many people were you know, uh, wounded. We received until the end of yesterday 183 uh, wounded. Majority of them are civilians, including children. And these people were caught in the crossfire in the, in the main in the town where they were doing their normal business. MSF says the El Fasher South Hospital is the only hospital open in the area. And it's not just the recently wounded that have been coming in. 
Today, the only hospital that's functioning in al is the, uh, this uh, hospital that's supported by MSF. We're trying to assist the population as much as possible. It's not only the wounded that are arriving to the hospital. We also have the mothers that want to deliver, people who have other kinds of uh, diseases that, are, that, that cannot go to other hospitals because all the other three hospitals that were functional in the town and today all of them closed. The reasons why the other three hospitals in the area closed vary, Abdallah said. Because of different reasons, sometimes it's reasons related, the personnel not feeling safe to go there. There are also reasons because the hospital is close to the, to the areas which, were, which had the intensified fighting in the last... He also says that as of yesterday, 25 people who were checked into the hospital have succumbed to their wounds. The World Food Program has announced the temporary suspension of operations across the county following the killing of three staff caught in the crossfire in North Darfur. Maria Majalu, VOA News, Nairobi. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on The Voice of America. I'm James Butt in Washington. Today is Wednesday, April 19. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. In Tunisia, the former head of the parliament and leader of the Muslim Democratic Party, Ananda Rachi Ganucci, was taken from his home by a large number of police and interrogated overnight. His party's offices were also raided and closed by police. After his interrogation, Ganucci was taken to hospital over concerns for his health. Reporter Elicia Falkman has more from Tunis. Police officers made their move Monday evening at sundown, the time when Muslims break their fast in the holy month of Ramadan. That's when they descended on the home of Rashid Ganoushi, arresting the former head of the parliament and lead of the Muslim Democratic Party in Nahda. He was taken to a location now confirmed to be the army barracks in the Tunis suburb of El Awina for interrogation. His daughter Yusra explains what happened to her father last night. Are still refusing to allow any lawyers to enter to exercise their duty. They are insisting that he can be held with without access to lawyers for 48 hours. Uh, in the meantime, they are insisting on beginning the interrogation, but my father is uh, refusing to answer questions without the presence of his lawyers. They have insisted on keeping him in the interrogation room, sitting on a chair for the entire night. Uh, he uh, asked to use the restroom. They refused to allow him to close the door, uh, go there in privacy, which he uh, has uh, refused. So we are concerned about the inhumane conditions of uh, his detention. The public prosecutor accuses Ganushi of inciting a civil war and supporters of President Syed, such as Osama Audit, who is the leader of the Nationalist Party Ashab or the People's Movement, welcomes the move. He tells Voice of America that he believes that President Syed was correct to arrest him because he says Ganushi was sending a clear message to his followers to start a civil war. He also says the law should be applied to all those who threaten the country's security, even if it means the death penalty. However, Ganushi's daughter Yusra says that her father was warning of the risks of civil conflict should Syed eliminate political diversity in Tunisia. My father stated that uh, one of the main successes of the National Salvation Front is to go beyond political and ideological polarization, anyone that imagining a Tunisia without this or that group, a Tunisia without a Nahda, a Tunisia without political Islam, a Tunisia without the left or any of its components would be laying the ground for civil war. Later Monday night, the police surrounded and evacuated party offices, which they say will remain closed until they have completed their investigations. On Tuesday morning, the offices of the National Salvation Front were also surrounded. Voice of America has attempted to contact its leader, Najib Shebi, but has received no response. It has also been confirmed that Ganushi was taken to the hospital following his night of interrogation, but details of his health have yet to be disclosed. Syed's latest actions against political opposition could have serious consequences. William Lawrence, a former diplomat and professor of political science at the American University in Washington, D.C., explains. The latest moves by Kai Saeed show a lack of political skill and a lack of geopolitical skill, which are sure to worsen Tunisia's political economic 
economic and security situation over time. Although it will endear him to some of his strongest supporters and to some of his outside backers like the Egyptians, but those are short-term victories. The diplomatic service of the European Union says that they are following the developments since Monday night with deep concern, but like many others, still do not have the full picture of what is unfolding now in Tunisia. I'm Alicia Folkman in Tunis. Tunisia. Mozambique has asked the World Health Organization to supply an additional 2 million doses of a cholera vaccine as the country struggles to control a spreading outbreak. Charles Maguiru reports from Maputo, Mozambique. The head of the Department of National Health Surveillance at the Ministry of Health, Domingos Kihole, tells VOA in an interview that government awaits the WHO's response to the cholera vaccine request, admitting difficulties due to the high global demand for vaccines. In this moment in Mozambique, the cholera situation is not good. It's not good because we have 10 provinces affected with cholera. We have 53 districts affected in whole country with cholera. And now we have 45 with active cholera disease. The officials say the intention is to vaccinate the population in high-risk areas, such as the northern province of Nampula and Zambezia in the central part of the country. Both provinces were hard hit by Cyclone Freddy, which tore across Mozambique for the second time inside two weeks last month. All five provinces impacted by Freddy on its first and second passes have witnessed cholera outbreaks. In addition to the risk of cholera, the government is greatly concerned about the potential increase in cases of other waterborne diseases like dysentery as well as malaria, both which number among the leading causes of mortality in Mozambique. During almost seven months, I'm talking about October or September 22 up to the, up to April. I'm talking about 16 of April. We have notified 27,000 cases of cholera with 124 deaths. So this situation is not good. We have to say to all Mozambicans that must follow the recommendation of the Minister of Health relating to the hygiene of water, hygiene of food, uh, even the quality Asian as well. In many parts of Mozambique, health workers are struggling to treat infected citizens at clinics and hospitals that were badly damaged by Cyclone Freddy. The record-breaking storm, which lasted for several weeks, killed dozens of people in Mozambique and Malawi and destroyed many roads and bridges in addition to hospitals. Charles Manguiro for VOA News, Maputo, Mozambique. Nigeria has become the second African country to approve Oxford University's R21 malaria vaccine just a week after Ghana. The World Health Organization says malaria kills more people in Nigeria every year than any other country in the world. The vast majority of the victims are children. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja, Nigeria. Nigeria's National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control, NAVDAC, announced a provisional approval of the R21 vaccine during a media briefing on Monday. The regulatory agency's consent came days after Ghana approved the vaccine. NAVDAC said the vaccine is 70 to 80 percent efficient in preventing the mosquito-borne disease and could protect millions of children. The agency's director general, Mujisola Adeyeye, spoke to journalists in Abuja. The vaccine is indicated for prevention of clinical malaria in children from 5 months to 36 months of age. NAVDAC did not say when the vaccine will be rolled out, but Adeya said Nigeria will conduct in-country clinical trials and pharmacovigilance study. WHO says some 600,000 people die of malaria every year, most of them in Africa, many of them young children. Nigeria accounts for the highest numbers of cases and deaths from malaria globally, 27% and 32% respectively. Health experts say the vaccine could be a game changer. Kunle Olobayo is a lead researcher at the National Institute for Pharmaceutical Research and Development. A a proactive, preemptive um, intervention 
will definitely be most useful, especially in countries like Nigeria. The fact that the very many interventions and steps that have been taken to reduce transmission have not been very successful because of um, our level of development, poverty. So it will definitely change the dynamics. WHO has yet to approve the vaccine. WHO Nigeria Malaria Program Head Linda also says authorities are still reviewing the vaccine's safety and efficacy. WHO is reviewing uh, the R21 data, you know, and it's being supported by an independent global advisory group uh, on immunization and malaria experts. This group will advise WHO on whether to recommend the R21 vaccine for use. It has to be approved by WHO to complement the rollout of effects of the first vaccine. Last year, WHO consented to the world's first malaria vaccine, Moscurix. Olobayo says without donor support, African countries could struggle to acquire the vaccines. If we think of domestic funding, national funding, I have concerns about that. Vaccines in Nigeria historically tend to be dependent on donor funding. I have a feeling that um, there might be some um, substantial international funding to get this uh, product uh, widely used. Oxford University is working with the Serum Institute of India to produce up to 200 million doses of the R21 every year. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. A Zimbabwean actress battling cancer has asked wealthy citizens to buy a radiotherapy machine for government hospitals because she says the country's only unit has stopped working. As Columbus Mavunga reports from Harare, many blamed Zimbabwe's high mortality rate among cancer patients on the country's poor state of health. Tinopona Tintin Katsande, a Zimbabwean actress, says she's almost done with her treatment for cervical cancer at a private hospital. She says the government hospitals had no working radiotherapy machines, so her family helped raise money for radiation therapy at a private hospital. Katsande says she has met other cancer patients who have not been so lucky. My peers that I have met in support groups, like just last, when I penned that, I had lost six. I lost six women with such potential and with such vibe and with such power that had been taken down you know, through cervical cancer, particularly even, because treatment cannot be completed without the service of the radiotherapy. Jennifer Juliet Mugonda from Kadoma, a mining town about a two-hour drive southwest of Harare has cancer too. She says doctors at a local government hospital asked her to stop going there and seek help at a private hospital about 400 kilometers away near Zimbabwe's border with Mozambique. She has not been treated for cancer for about three years now. She fears for the worst. I am still surviving. But I know where I am going. Cancer kills. So I am finished. So what I know is my failure to get treatment is leading to my death. Zimbabwe's Minister of Health did not confirm or deny claims that government hospitals have no working radiotherapy machines and declined viewers' request for further comment. Katande is asking the country's wealthy citizens to help people like Mugonda. Some way, somehow, we've got to come together to buy at least one radiotherapy machine. You cannot holistically treat cancer without a full treatment, and one important part of it is the radiotherapy. Without the machine, that cannot be done. Meanwhile, Jennifer Juliet Mugonda is trying to raise money so that she can finally get the medication and treatment she needs at a distant private hospital. Columbus Mavunga for VOA News, Harare, Zimbabwe. And that's it for this Wednesday, April 19th edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for coming aboard with us 